Moving on to today's presentation, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Greg Hollows. Greg is the Vice President of the Imaging Business Unit here at Edmund Optics and has 20 years of experience in imaging and vision technology. He began his career at Edmund Optics as an engineering technician and quickly moved up, now leading everything pertaining to imaging and vision for Edmund Optics. As a thought leader in the industry, Greg has authored numerous articles throughout his career on imaging technology and as a sought after speaker on optical technology. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Hello, everyone. Um, today, we're gonna to spend a bit of time reviewing and trying to understand how to maximize what goes on your imaging and machine vision system. And we've come up with a group of nine tips that we think go a long way to helping you with that. But uh, I wanna take a quick step back and just understand why this is important. And what we've seen over the last many years is a proliferation of more advanced imaging technology that relates to the sensor. From a sensor point of view, the amount of pixels that are available for us to image with and the size of them, both the, the resolutions have gone up and the pixel size has gone down. And it's uh, created a real capability to do things that we've never been able to do before. But there are limitations in these systems. And it's usually relating to the optics and the lighting, but mostly to the optics in the system these days. The frustration that can come into play for many people putting imaging systems in is when it doesn't work to the desired effect that you're expecting from the sensor and the pixel sizes that you've chosen. From an optical point of view, one of two things could be in play. One of them is that you're not using the right optical components. The other thing that could come into play is you've actually hit the laws of physics limitation of what optics can actually produce in your application. Either way, those effects look an awful lot alike because the system is not performing the way you wanted it or had desired. What we really wanna to get to today is helping you understand the differences between those two things. And these nine tips are designed to help you overcome some of the issues related to not always getting the system fully laid out the way you want and ways to quickly and most importantly cost effectively get the desired results. I'd like to start off with an example for you here so that you can see one of the effects that comes into play if you're not utilizing the right optics in your system. I mean, the physics part of the issue is not really in play here. Really what we're seeing is that the actual choice of the components was not necessarily correct. So in this application, this is a real world application, we're looking at the tops of pharmaceutical bottles. We have two examples here, both using a five megapixel camera, smart camera system. The size of the pixels on that camera in both uh, examples here is 3.45 microns. So reasonably small, not as small as what's on the market, but it's, it's a reasonable push on the optical performance that you can see. And five megapixels is a reasonably good resolution for what's being used in, in the market today. Using the same lighting in both of these scenarios, but the big difference here is changing out the optics. Now, what we had selected is two different optics that were designed to do two different things from their base uh, design capabilities. But the key thing that they have is they have the same focal length, they're being used at the same F number, same working distance. So baseline, they actually look a lot of light, like if you looked at the specification sheets. And what we wanna look at is the performance in the middle and the performance at the edge. Now, what we're gonna look at here uh, at those middles and the edges is the 2D data matrix or the 2D barcode that's uh, at the top on these bottles. And what happens in these pharmaceutical applications is medication is put into the bottles, they're immediately capped, crimped, and this 2D data matrix is laser etched into the surface of the, what's called the cap skirt in this uh, application. That contains the date and lot code information, information about the actual uh, medication that's in the bottle. And in many pharmaceutical lines, they won't do the same medication over and over again on that line forever. They'll have to put different things in on that line, do different types of medication. They have to make sure that the things in the machine are exactly what they're supposed to be. So eventually when they do get labeled, the right things are getting labeled. In some cases, blank bottles will come out of the machine and they'll be sent to another facility to be labeled. So the way they can identify the information about what's actually in the bottle, because the, the, most of the medications are clear, is by this 2D data matrix. So good reads on this are important for two very big reasons. One, it's medication. It should be read correctly so that you make sure you're getting the right injection. Uh, you know, you trust your doctors and your hospitals to do that. So that's really important and we all like our health to be good. The second thing is that bad reads will get lead to good products potentially being discarded, which is a, a problem from a financial point of view for the pharmaceutical manufacturer. So there's multiple reasons to have these good reads. So we look at the middle section here using those two different lenses. We can see that the 2D data matrices are pretty easily read. One's a slightly lower contrast than the other, but they're both very strong pieces of information to be read there. As we move out to the bottle on the right-hand side and look what's going on at the edges here, and you can see that with the red highlighted boxes that are there, 
between the two different lenses, we see a distinct difference in performance between these two bottles. What you're really looking at here, I want to give you some context around the contrast that can be seen, is about 50% contrast on the left and about 15% contrast on the right. The resolutions actually are the same. You can see the same number of details and the same size details. It's just a much different level of contrast. Now, the reason that there's this difference here, even though everything about these products is exactly the same on a specification sheet, one was designed for more security-based applications, looking at things at very long distances away. And when it's pulled in close to look at this field of view that has these three bottles in it, that's about four to five inches across, the detail that's able to be resolved because the lens wasn't designed to work there as effectively do not come out as well. That's the lens on the right. The lens on the left, where it was designed pretty much solely around that sort of working distance and field of view, gets much better performance there. Using the right lens for the right application go a long way. What we want to go through in the rest of the presentation here and show you these nine tips that we think will get you very quickly to what you want to do and get the best performance possible. And in many cases, you're really, right after you choose the sensor that you want to use, you've got to start thinking about the optics in the system that guarantee you get the performance that you desire. So let's start off with the first tip. You need to allow room in your imaging system for the optics. Going back many years ago when resolutions were very, very low and pixels were fairly large, you could use a range of optical components to get similar performance by, and condense the size of the system. You could go with smaller optics, you could go with shorter working distances, and make the area from the camera to the object fairly compact. Problem is nowadays with the higher resolutions that are out there, and the smaller pixel sizes, in order to get the maximum level of performance, the optics really want to grow in size when you do designs. The reason they want to grow is that the way to get the higher levels of performance is we need more degrees of freedom when we design in the optics. That includes adding more optical elements, more pieces of glass, more, that lets us have more curvatures because there are more elements to work with. These degrees of freedom let us bend those rays to where they need to be and maximize how tightly the rays are packed to get that information that you want to see, those details that you want to see back to the right spot. Like I said, these things make the optics want to grow in size. You got to give room and allowance for that because you have to make trade-offs if you want to compact the size and it's usually related to performance. Second part of that is, is that if you're doing some certain types of measurement applications and you want to look at objects maybe that are five, six, 10 inches across, and you want to get very tight, accurate measurements on their size, you need very large optical components to do this. You can see this in the picture. We have uh, one of our employees there to give you a, a size feeling for what that lens actually takes up. And that lens there would let you see about a 10-inch object and get very tight measurements on it. But as you can see, it is rather large. It needs to be accommodated for in the design of the system in order for it to work. Other things that come into place, depending on the geometry of the ob object that you want to look at and the size of it, you could end up with rather large illumination setups. This means that you have to accommodate the, for that in the size and the area for where the optics have to be. <clears throat> As an example, if you have to use a uh, large dome light, this is something that will give you a nice flat illumination on a cr curved surface, and that dome needs to be 12, 14 inches across, you're going to need to have a standoff of about that length as well from the lenses. So you have to accommodate for this in your system. So you always want to start there and give yourself room for flexibility as you're working out your system. The second tip kind of relates back to the first a little bit, but this is where you get into forgiveness in the optical designs themselves. We give an example here in the second bullet point that you really want to have a uh, working distance with your lens system that's two to four times the size of the field of view. As an example, we have here, we have 200 millimeter fields of view. You really want to be 200 millimeters to 400 millimeters away to maximize performance of the lenses and maximize the cost uh, benefits that you can get. If we look at the example there on the bottom in the images, the four and a half millimeter lens, what you'll see is we're looking at this 100 millimeter field of view, but we're very, very close to the object. Now that's beneficial if you don't have a lot of space, but the problem is if you look at the actual ray bundles, and the way we think of things is in how these bundles come together and how they're bent back through the system. You'll notice that the one in the middle in the blue and the ones at the top in the purple, they're very different lengths and they're very different levels of obliqueness going into the lens. That bending of those rays back at those distances is very hard to do and you usually make a trade-off in performance by doing that. If you look at the top example here, you get a much gentler change from the centers to the edges. It's easier to control the rays and you usually get much better performance. Another way that you could think of this as well in terms of a tip is that if you've chosen a sensor, if you think about the general sensor size, the diagonal of the sensor, let's take an example of a two-third inch sensor, that has an 11 millimeter diagonal to it. That's the physical dimension going from corner to corner on that sensor. 
you're going to want a focal length of the lens that's usually two to four times that diagonal in order to maximize performance at the lowest cost that you can obtain on the market. This is going to give you the best overall capabilities and will usually in some cases let you see if the lens and the camera together can actually meet the performance that you want. If you're struggling in this sort of ratio, it's going to be hard to do it at other positions and you might have to actually change some of the criteria that you have to make things work. Tip number three, you really want to be thinking about illumination. Uh, the, the lens is incredibly important, but it's the signal conditioning part of the system. There is going to be some amount of loss of contrast in any resolution that you're working with. Presenting the highest level of contrast to the lens is critical in order for us to get the best performance. You're going to want the illumination to actually pull out the highest level of detail off of that object. Let's think that through for a moment. If I have an object that only has 50% contrast coming off of it, but I illuminate it in a way that only that knocks it down to say 20% contrast, that's all the lens has to work with to get some information back to the sensor. If the lens has a 50% drop off, you only put 10% contrast at the sensor level. If you remember back to the example that we had up front with those pharmaceutical bottles with 15% contrast, it can be very difficult to pull out the details that you want to see. So maximizing contrast is critically important. And the example that we have here, we're looking at this object. This happens to be a rod with a screw piece on the end of it. And it's a reflective surface. It's, and it's, it's a, as it's a rod, it has a curved surface to it. And we have it imaged against a backlight. That backlight is designed to make a silhouetted image. But we'll notice some things that stick out here. If we look at the edge of that rod, you can see that there's a lighter edge to it where the light off the backlight, which is not coming out parallel to the light or perpendicular to the light itself, it's coming off in a scatter pattern is creating this soft or not as dark edge to the object. Things like this other detail here, we might be looking for a defect or some fibrous material that's on there in this case. That can be seen, but that's low contrast in this case. Not too bad, but it's a problem if you're trying to do an accurate measurement on this, especially if there's different levels of reflectivity from object to object. Pulling off an exact measurement can be rather difficult. Choosing a proper type of illumination here, something that's a collimated illumination or a telecentric illuminator, will alleviate those sorts of issues. Now, it's not to say that this type of illumination is the best type of illumination. In this application example, it does make a significant difference. Whatever illumination maximizes your contrast is generally the best one to choose. You can see here those edges are dark. They're separated from the background very well, and that fibrous material is now standing out very dramatically. Looking at the side-by-side -side comparison, you can see a significant difference between the two systems here by choosing the right illumination. In this sort of scenario, if you actually look at the cost structure of one illumination set up to the other, they're almost identical uh, in this example in this size field of view. So the benefit here is that you're giving much better performance back to the camera system, and having all these things done correctly goes a long way to maximizing your performance. Tip number three, and this is one of those ones that uh, if you walk away with this one, it's a really a good one because this is an example of where over what's been done traditionally, you might be able to pick up 30% performance in your system just by making some adjustments here. So let's start with the formula that's on the lower left side. When we start talking about what's the smallest detail that we can reproduce back onto the sensor, we have to look at what the laws of physics limitations are. Up until this point, we've talked about things about moving from uh, potentially a lower performing product to something that's more uh, commensurate with what the system's supposed to do. But at some point, we start approaching what can be done by the laws of physics. This formula tells us the smallest detail that we can reproduce onto the sensor. Now think about it for a moment. If the pixels that we're using are very large, you know, 10 microns, 20 microns in size, we'll see this formula doesn't matter as much. When we start dropping down to four microns, three, two, one micron, we're gonna see this formula come into play very, very fast. And this minimum spot size is 2.44 times lambda, which is the wavelength of light you're using times the F number. When you multiply these things together, you get a spot size that is in microns. What this does is let us connect what's the smallest detail an optic can produce by the laws of physics limitation to the pixel size that we're utilizing in the system. The table at the top lets us walk through that. It has a list of wavelengths, and we've listed out the different colors that they represent. We give the wavelength uh, in nanometers, and then we have the F numbers of the lenses that could be used. The, the grid that's laid out there shows you the actual spot sizes that can be produced in microns under these scenarios. We'll look at the one right in the center, the green, which is 520 which is at F4, that's a five micron spot size. That is the best by physics you'll be able to produce under that scenario and that condition. If you're on a two micron pixel, that means you'll be the best spot that you can create as five microns under this scenario. You will have the detail that you want to see, the smallest that you can create it is actually bigger than the pixels that you're utilizing. 
that means you're not going to see all the detail that you want. Most vision applications for a very long time were either using white light or red illumination. White is a mixture of all the different illuminations that are there, but red was a very popular monochromatic illumination. Monochromatic illumination eliminates some other issues in lenses, so it does make the performance generally better. But red is a longer wavelength portion of the visible spectrum than things like green and blue. As we look down that table, look at the F4 section again. In the red, we're at 6.44 microns. Green is 5.08, and then the blue is 4.59. So we're making this progression to smaller and smaller spot sizes. That's helpful. Going from red to blue in your illumination choices can go a long way, about 30% to increasing performance. We have two imaged examples at the bottom here and the way these were set up. So we chose a uh, fairly high resolution camera, uh, both in terms of number of pixels and pixel size. And then we set the lens so that it was at the laws of physics limit. We looked at this target here and we looked what this target has, it has alternating lines in a radial pattern. As you move out across the radius or across the circle, the lines get further apart and they get wider. So we're seeing high, uh, lower frequencies, we're seeing bigger objects. As we start moving towards the center, we see higher frequencies and smaller details. So we're able to see as things go from the laws of physics limits that we can see them till they blur out. As we get to the middle, we get this blurry area where we no longer see the detail and that's being created by the F number of the lens and the wavelength of light that we're choosing. The blue circle that's in this scenario lets us see where at 660 or red illumination, we can no longer see detail. That's transposed onto the image on the right, which is using blue illumination. You can see that the detail that we're able to actually resolve goes down a bit further under the blue illumination, about 30% further. But the other thing I want you to take note of, if you go out to the edges of those two images, in the higher, uh, sorry, the lower frequency space, the larger detail space, we're seeing blacker blacks and whiter whites under the 470 illumination as well. The contrast has increased even in these lower frequency areas. The takeaway there is regardless of whether the object is smaller or larger, you'll be able to see more detail and more information by choosing the correct illumination in your setup in terms of a wavelength uh, point of view. That combined with the last example in terms of giving good contrast to the lens goes an incredibly long way to making things work. Here's an example of this, and we want to walk through and show you on that same sort of pixel size that we were talking about in the first example for the pharmaceutical application, what actually happens when you image through a lens and the details you can see at the different wavelengths and how it works its way back to the sensor and then into the software. We look at these examples here. We have blue, green, red, and then the white is representing IR. As we work through from shorter wavelengths at blue to longer wavelengths at the IR, you can see the spots that are created by these different colors continue to advance in size. The sensor itself, while it would not give back blue, green, or red necessarily, but utilizing those colors just to represent what they are, you can see as we move from blue to the IR, we're losing information. From an actual detail or theoretical point of view, we're going from about 78% contrast at blue to 22% contrast at white. As we open and close the aperture and change the F number, this will have effects as well. And we're going to see that in the next couple of slides when we try and tie best resolution together with how depth of field actually works and the trade-offs that you have to make. Tip number five, and it is, is uh, specifically about those trade-offs. What I want to show you here is how the actual cones of light get bigger and smaller as you change your F number and how it affects depth of field and how depth of field actually works theoretically. Example on the left, we have an F number of 2.8. That means we have more light collection. A lower F number in a lens allows for more light collection. And remember by the other formula, the lower the F number, the smaller the spot that we could create, so the better detail we could see. In this example here, you can see though, as we move an object that's of a certain finite size, two millimeter increments closer to the camera, moving up the cone that is being focused down onto the sensor, you can see that that object, that detail, is at the tip of the cone at best focus, and as it moves two millimeters in, it's filling most of the cone, but it's, it's almost at the edges, and I move another two millimeters in, the cone is larger than the object itself. That means the detail and the information that's on both sides of that object are now getting into the cone and being imaged onto the sensor at that depth of field position. Now, when you're going through air, that's not a problem, but if you have an object of different heights, that's where blurriness comes from. Move another two millimeters, you can see almost the cone is made up of everything else almost but the object itself, and that gets blurry. Move over to the F8 position. You'll see that the cone is smaller. When you go to F8, we've reduced the amount of light that can go through the lens. We've reduced the aperture size and thus reduced the top of the cone. So the ray angles don't change as uh, rapidly as at f2.8 because the cone is smaller. 
So I move that object to each one of those two millimeter positions through the system, you can see they take up the entire cone no matter where they're at. Thus, details to the right or the left or the top or the bottom of that object cannot be seen in that cone. You get better depth of field, you're able to see more information as you go to a higher F number. But we did say on the last slide, as I go to a higher F number, I start losing resolution and detail. And that's where your trade-off comes into play here. We want to combine tip four and five here to actually see all that detail together. At F2.8, you can see these cones are varying very, very rapidly. As you look from left or right, you can see how the cones start overlapping with different objects. The empty space or the white space that might be between them start blurring together and I lose my detail. But the example on the bottom there shows nice tight um, spots that are created on the sensor and good detail that can be seen under most of the wavelengths that are here. As I go over to F8, I get a lot more flexibility. I can see better depth, but at best focus, I've traded off detail. One of the best ones to look at here is the red ones. On the left-hand side, I have much clearer information in red than I do on the one on the right, but I've got better depth of field. The real takeaway here is that if you need maximum performance, maximum resolution, and you want a lot of depth of field, it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to achieve. And in most cases, even if you used to move to the best lens on the market, there is definitely going to be a laws of physics limitation to how far you can push things. This becomes more impactful as pixels get smaller. Imagine for a moment if I took all the pixels on this screen and made them half the size, basically be putting four pixels in the place of one. You could see the problems that you would have that you would be blurring very, very quickly no matter what, and you would lose a lot of detail very fast. In many applications, if it's allowable, going to a larger sensor that has bigger pixels helps relieve this issue and is a great way to try and get around some of these trade-offs. Number six, no one lens can solve every application. The reason for this is, and you can remember this back to the uh, first example that we showed with the pharmaceutical bottles, the reason that there was differences in performance really had to do with where one lens was designed to look at parking lots and do security and look at a very long distance away, and the other one was designed to work very up close. They have different purposes and different needs, and it right, when you set in those needs into the design, you actually get a different uh, product usually out the other end. So it's very hard to have one lens that can work exceptionally well far away, exceptionally well close, and do a wide range of fields of view. What that means is more sensors come out, more sensor coverages have to be hit, and pixels change size, and applications land in different spaces, while there's this greater range of applications that can be solved by all these sensors that come out, you actually need more optics to cover all the applications. It's getting more and more difficult to have a full family of products that can cover that whole range. The critical takeaway here is that you really want to make sure you take the time to understand what that lens was designed for to guarantee it's going to perform to the maximum capability of your application. This is especially true when you're looking at objects of smaller and smaller size. The variation and change of the different lenses kind of goes, uh, accelerates the difference between them, and you want to make sure you're getting the right thing for the application. Number seven, uh, we start transitioning here from what the optics actually do to what can be brought to the table uh, by you or your customer or the end user. You really want to understand what you're trying to achieve. Are you looking at a flat, highly reflective metal surface uh, like the can lid on the right? Are you looking at a light bulb or the details inside of it like the one on the left? Are you trying to pick up those 2D, 2D data matrices that are on a curved edge? Um, understanding what you want to achieve, but other things too. Over time, what sort of variation of materials could there be? Are you looking at different colored plastics and you're trying to do color matching? Uh, upstream, you know, if, if there's a change in the materials that are being used that give a same visual color to you and I, it might actually affect what the camera system is seeing if you're doing color matching. Understanding that that's a possibility down the line is really, really important. The other thing that you want to do is usually what you're looking at is to either uh, validate that something is correct or look for areas or edges where things are starting to fall out of the desired capability of what you're making. Giving the things at the edge, the, the marginal passes and marginal fails, for example, that need to be tested are critically important for making things go. Having a perfect product that you want to have imaged and getting all the detail off on that, um, while not always easy, is more straightforward than getting that one that's a marginal pass or a marginal fail and determining that they actually work the way you want them to. And having that information up front is critically important. Number eight, you should ask a lot of questions. Um, imaging is uh, not always easy and it's continuing to get harder as applications get more diverse and more demanding. Being able to 
ask the right questions, get the right details back, and then getting an explanation as to why things do or do not work is critically important. You should expect a lot out of all of your suppliers, and they should be able to educate you on why you should use one solution over another and why it would work in one scenario and not another. Last tip, understanding the fundamental parameters of an imaging system. Now, there's a whole other set of um, uh, webinars and uh, videos that we do on these specific areas, but understanding these things walking in is critically important. We're not going to go into depth on them today, but understand these are the things that you will want to look at to guarantee that you get the desired results. Understanding why you need a circuit working distance, what's the field of view that we require, what's the limiting resolution or desired resolution is very, very important. How much depth of field do you really need? Remember back to tip number five that you have to compromise at some point between resolution and depth of field. What do you really require and how demanding is that versus other specifications? What sort of distortion can you tolerate in a measurement application? That can get very complicated and complex at times. How much measurement accuracy do you need? We talk about perspective there on the lower left side of the uh, right-hand image. And having all that in place is critically important. Before I go here, I just want to give you a quick review of things. Remember, you want to allow room for your system to make it work. You really want to have a good ratio of field of view to working distance. That rule, again, is you want to have two to four times the working distance related to the field of view that you're looking at. If you're looking at 100 millimeter field of view, you really want a 200 to 400 millimeter working distance to get the most, the highest performing product in most cases at the best price. Choosing the illumination, the color of that illumination can go a long way to maximizing performance. We're taking a system that's marginally working and making it work really, really well. You have to compromise between resolution and depth of field at times. It's impossible to get the highest resolution everywhere all the time. There's going to have to be some changes that you might have to make there, and that's really a laws of physics issue. Keep in mind, no one lens is going to solve everything. You might have a lens that worked great for one application. There's no guarantee it's going to solve the next one. Understand what you're looking to achieve. Ask those questions, and come in understanding what some of those fundamentals are that you have to work with to make that system go. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to hand it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Greg. Please note, we still have a team of expert engineers answering the questions you've submitted in Q&A. They'll continue to answer your questions after the webinar has concluded. Additionally, we answered many of your questions during the webinar, and there were a few common and notable ones that came up that I think are worth sharing. So with that being said, uh, one question, Greg, um, that came up quite a few times is, what is MTF? MTF stands for Modulation Transfer Function. That wasn't really discussed in uh, uh, this presentation at all, but what that is is the ability to allow you to rationalize what the, at a given resolution what the contrast of that lens is going to produce. Uh, that's a separate topic, but it's one that allows you to see just how much performance you're going to get out of the system at a desired resolution. Great, thank you. And another question that came up quite a few times is, should I choose monochrome or color for my application? Uh, using monochrome versus color, that can deal with the illumination or the camera. Um, really what comes into play there is when you're designing a lens, one of the bigger things that you struggle with is getting all the wavelength of light, all the colors to land at the exact same point. If, they're, uh, if one color is focusing a little bit smaller, one's a little bit bigger, you're going to get a little bit of blurriness, or if they separate kind of like a rainbow, they will scatter over multiple pixels. If you go down to one color, it would be monochromatic. Uh, that can go a long way to increasing the performance because you've basically eliminated the other colors that are causing you some problems. From a camera perspective, that also is something that comes into play. So if you are looking at something that can be visualized in black and white, using a monochrome camera gives you about a 15% kick over a color camera in terms of overall performance. Most of those color cameras have to do some interpolation with the same size array to get the color information out. You generally have a degradation of resolution when you do that. Great, thanks, Greg. That covers it. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Uh, just a reminder, a link to today's recording will be sent to all participants shortly. You can also reach us via email, the Eminoptics 1-800 number, or through the live chat feature on our website. So thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Greg, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.